This talk is How to Fix a Font by Nathan Willis. Again, questions at the end, um, and I will be running around with the mic. So put your hand up nice and high and try and keep it up until I get to you. We just need the mic so that we get the questions recorded on our tapes. Thank you for that. Okay, so this here is Nathan Willis, who is talking on how to fix a font. Nathan Willis is a reporter and editor at the Linux news site lwn.net, and he's also a freelance font designer whose open source fonts have been included in the Google Web Font Collection, and he's co-founder of the Texas Linux Fest conference, and a contributor to the Open Font Library project. So over to you, Nathan. Thank you very much. I hope everyone will join me in welcoming you here today. Uh, before I actually get into the slides themselves, I always, I've given this talk a few times and I want to take a quick poll of the audience. Would you raise your hand if you're either your native language or the very first language that you learned is written in something other than the Latin alphabet? Okay, just one person. Do you mind shouting out what it is, what alphabet? Okay. And uh, that's sort of, oh yes? German, okay. So German is uh, you know, extended from um, the basic Latin alphabet, but that sort of illustrates the, the issue we have with fonts a lot of times, is that when we live in the English-speaking world, we're very privileged by having way more than we could ever want or would ever use. Um, so I had another question I was going to ask, too. Let me think what it was. Oh, I'm, I'm also just curious if anyone has, in their own personal experience, just run across an instance where there's a font you wanted to use for something, and there was a problem with it. Um, OK. Was this a uh, web design scenario? Raise your hand. No? Was it, uh, OK. Was it missing, missing characters? Anybody missing characters? OK. OK, that, that's, that's about typical. There's a few scenarios that we all run into. Um, and that's, that's, why this is, that's why this is a talk, I think, that's worth, worth giving. Um, before I really get started also, we do need to mention that the, uh, most of this information was covered in the uh, introduction. But uh, yeah, I, I do design fonts. I've been doing that for about three years, coming up in three years now. And most of the examples that I'll show here are pictures of my own fonts because they have the most errors. That's just a convenience. Um, but the bigger question everybody wants to know is, is why bother? And if you're one of the people that raised your hand a minute ago, you know the answer to this. Um, because fonts aren't magic, they can have problems just like any other piece of software. Um, the other thing to remember is that fonts are software, even if we think of them as, as data, as static things most of the time. They, they are blocks of instructions that are fed into an interpreter that then renders paths and then adjusts, moves forward and renders another path. So there's a lot going on there. And what that means for free software is that you have those same four freedoms with font software as you do with any other software. Be, may not know that you can exercise it. Um, but if you're one of those people who did not raise your hand, you are going to run into a situation when you'll want to exercise that freedom and modify a font. Um, the font epiphany can take different forms. It could be something you're writing and a character is missing. It could be when you decide or when you get tasked with coming up with the logo for a project and you discover that none of the fonts that you found quite look right. They're all almost right. But on all of them, either the C has a little funny thing attached to it, or the period is a square, and that just looks wrong, or you know, something like that. So it'll happen to you sooner or later, and then you'll be happy that web fonts exist. Or I'm sorry, that open fonts exist. But that is uh, my next point, is that open fonts in one form or another have existed for a while, but it really has only been the past few years when we could deliver fonts through the web to web browsers that it's taken off as sort of a movement on its own. and. Uh, that has opened this idea up to a lot of people who uh, need to be told, I guess need to, need to learn for themselves, that they're qualified to see that something is wrong with the font and to do something to fix it. The reason is that the type isn't created by people who live in a separate world and then delivered to you. Uh, the shapes of letters and things have evolved with the eye over the millennia as we've developed our writing systems, so your eye is just as trained to recognize this looks wrong, that looks too close, that looks too short, as anybody else's eye. And uh, I'm going to switch real briefly to the document camera, perhaps. This is a book called Start Designing with FontForge. This is a, a free book. It was written just like a month ago at Google's documentation camp. Uh, myself and 
four other people were like uh, selected to go there and learn about documentation in this one-week sprint thing. And one of the other designers who's way more experienced than me made a comment in the introduction to this that your eye is qualified to make design decisions, even if you haven't taken courses in designing typography. But you do need to know uh, how to do that, and that's hopefully why I'm here. Um, just to add a little bit of a visual, a little bit of a roadmap here, the, uh, the things that could go wrong with a font are like any software, yeah, uh, almost infinite, but I want to talk about some really basic general categories. There's visual issues with the shape and, and look of things. There's issues with spacing, which a lot of times comes down to kerning, and I'll, I'll talk about that. And there's also a whole bunch of technical things, and I've sort of shortened this section of the talk every time I give it because there's just too many of those. There's all different requirements for PostScript fonts and true type fonts, whether things have to be on, you know, anyway. And then there's the, the dark matter category, which is things that aren't there. And as in fonts, as in physics, it's the things that aren't there that are often the most interesting. So we'll spend a little more time maybe talking about that at the end. Uh, visual things, though, I'm thinking probably something wrong with one particular character, one particular glyph. And that can take more than one form. That could be something aesthetically looks wrong, unbalanced, or it can be as wrong for the writing system and the language itself. And that's what I call orthographic. I'm not sure if that's the correct scientific term, but I think I can illustrate what it means. Um, just briefly, FontForge is the main tool that I'll show you how to do things with here, but there are others. Uh, FontForge does a lot of things in building and outputting fonts, but it also has a nice sort of vector editor that'll look familiar to you if you've used any other vector editing software. Um, this is a link to the, the book that I mentioned over there. You can download an EPUB or a PDF or look at it in HTML and on the website there. The point of the book is to talk about the design process with FontForge rather than to be a reference manual of all the functions because the FontForge uh, website already has a really good reference documentation section. Um, outside of FontForge, there's some other things that you'll probably want to have in your toolbox, like Font Matrix, which is, in theory, a tool for installing hundreds of fonts and only activating the ones you want to see, because you can only have so many fit on the screen before you're scrolling for minutes and minutes, and that's pretty annoying. But Font Matrix does include some really nice things for look, looking all the characters in the font and comparing two fonts overlaid on top of each other. So there's some, some helpful things you can do with, with Font Matrix. TTF Auto Hint is a command line tool that comes from the FreeType project. And it's got sort of one purpose, but it's really useful. And then in addition to that, there are a bunch of uh, JavaScript and HTML web tools that are pretty helpful, but we'll come to those as we need them. OK, so right into it. Visual errors, as I mentioned, two possibilities, the aesthetic and the orthographic. Uh, FontForge is what you'd use to address both of those. In this may, oh good, that's, that's very uh, non-stretched out, which is my concern. This is my example for an aesthetic error. This is not great looking. It's sort of flattened right there, which is awkward. This is sort of the emboldened version of an at sign that I made in a skinnier version. And so the emboldening process has sort of crunched in places. And you can see the corner of the A is sort of coming up real close to the circle. And that just sort of needs help. Um, an example of orthographic errors, the simplest example I can think of is this character, which I, as a native English speaker, refer to as the Russian backwards N, because as you can see, it looks exactly like the N, or at least it does in this font, which is News Cycle, which is one that I created. But it's not actually correct. And I had people who, who read Russian tell me this. And the reason I can kind of get away with it and you wouldn't necessarily notice that it's wrong is because new cycle is very low contrast, as we would say, which means that all the strokes are sort of the same width. But if you look at a font that has more contrast in it, like this one, you see that the, the correct version of the uh, Cyrillic character there, it doesn't have all the weights on the diagonal. It has it in the middle, which looks a little odd. But if you look at a serif version, then you'll see something like, oh, it's not a backwards in at all. It's, it's a long eye. It's two eyes that are sort of joined together there. But that's not the kind of thing that I would be able to figure out if I didn't know Russian or any other Cyrillic language just by looking at an example of another font that kind of got it wrong. Um, so anyway, like I said, all of these visual things are, are things that we can fix in FontForge. And the thing to 
remember going into FontForge is that uh, when it looks right, it's done. And I think Miles Davis said that. Um, it's a really, really obscure joke that, okay. Miles Davis said, I think, something along the lines of if it sounds, if it sounds right, it's right. Uh, and that's, that's sort of what you have to keep in mind when you're deciding, am I done tweaking this? This is what FontForge looks like if you just fire it up and open a font with it. And as you can see, on the right-hand side, big table with all the letters in the font. There's little headers that show you what they are. And they're highlighted, and there's sort of highlighting on the sides. Those mean different things. But where you do most of your work is over here on the left, which is sort of a vector editing window. And it's got a toolbox in the corner, which has familiar looking tools that you might have seen in Inkscape or something like that. You know, there's a hand, there's a magnifying glass, sort of an ink pen thing, uh, a knife. You might not see a knife in Inkscape, I'm not sure anymore. But a ruler, you know, so general stuff like that. You should feel at home looking at this canvas and saying, okay, I can probably figure out what the tools do. Um, so you can just grab one of those points with the hand and drag it to a new position. If you select a point, you get control handles and you can twist uh, and change the shape that way. But when you go into FontForge just looking to change shapes, you need to know that it isn't exactly like Inkscape and those other vector editors. There are some peculiarities that, that can throw you off. Um, the first is that the only thing that exists in FontForge in a font in a glyph is an outline. It's a contour or the outline of the, of the glyph. And that means it's sort of like a path. You put points together and they're connected in a path. But there's no such thing as a stroke. Like, it's not drawn. It's just the outside. And then the computer, when it's rendered, fills that in with the ink color if it's printing it or with whatever the color for the font is in the, in the application that it's displaying it. And that can throw you off if you're not used to the distinction there because the outline is only the outside. That means that it can't cross over itself on the inside. And there's some, some strange things that make it not quite like um, you're used to seeing paths in Inkscape. Another thing along the same lines is that we saw down at the bottom, there's a rectangle and a polygon there. And when you draw a rectangle and a polygon in a vector editor, you get a rectangle. Like, it has a, like two coordinates that say where its um, upper right-hand, lower left-hand corners are. And if you draw a polygon with 15 sides, you get a polygon that is defined as having 15 sides. It's got a center. It's got like a radius out there. If you do that in FontForge, you just get a path. And the second you've drawn it, it's just a path, and you can grab it and mess it up. Um, so if you want to draw something like a circle, it's really easy to do an Inkscape. A circle in Inkscape is a center and a radius, and you can twist it around, and it'll still be around. In FontForge, it's just going to be a bunch of dots that look like a circle the moment it was drawn. And uh, after that, it can be broken. There are other things that are going to jump up and bite you in FontForge, because it has some sharp corners to it, I like the fact that there's a grid. Uh, you don't really see the grid normally, but the way that a glyph is defined is it's points on a plane, right? And it's the sequence of points is tracing the outside of the glyph. And it's impossible for you to place a point in between grid sections. Like, you can only place a point on an integer. But FontForge itself is happy to mess that up and cause problems. So if you have two things that cross, and they happen to cross in between integer points, FontForge isn't going to stop you from doing that. It's just going to be an error that you'll have to fix. Along the same lines, if you have something that's perfectly aligned to the pixel grid, and then you do a transform, like you stretch it or shrink it, and the stretch or shrink happens to put it off of the integer coordinates, FontForge won't keep you from doing that. It'll just be wrong when you're done. Um, so you, you have to fight against it a little bit, but that's the kind of thing that you can, you can validate and, and fix at the end of the process. Um, but there are other things that, that FontForge does that are, that are really nice as far as drawing goes. And here I've highlighted the uh, point menu. And you can see at the top there, there's four kinds of points. Curve, HV curve, corner, and tangents. And that gives you a little bit more control over how, uh, how you construct the points that make up your line. Because an HV curve, those are the ones that you see on the very outside there. That just means it's either horizontal or vertical. It's not ever going to be off. And the font formats all want you to have a point at the very extreme edges of every glyph. And so you generally, because mathematically those things are always tangents, having a point that is just defined as being that way saves you from having to have it a little bit off and tweak it you know, pixel by pixel. Um, 
So don't hear me saying that, that Font Forge is bad just because it has these, these quirks to it. Um, another thing you should know is that Font Forge can open anything that's a font. And that means what you might think of as a binary, which is a, a TTF font that you just install. Um, but uh, if you can get a hold of the source for the font, if it's an open font, you should be able to do that. That's obviously better because the source SFD is FontForge's own format, and you can have multiple layers and things so that you can build and compare and cut pieces out and put them together. So obviously, working from the source is better. But if you just need to grab a true type font from somewhere and fix that weird looking character to use in the logo for your project, you can take the TTF and load it up in FontForge and edit it. The next general category is spacing errors. And this always sounds weird to people to think that space is, or that empty space is important. Um, and it, in the FontForge book that the other designers contributed so much more to than me, they devote a lot of a lot of time to getting the spacing right very early on. But the, the thing that it finally clicked with me was that when we say space, we're really just talking about the negative space that's formed by those same outlines, whereas if we just think about the interior of those outlines, well, we're still thinking of space. It's just that it's the space painted black instead of the space painted white. So the shapes of, of the characters do affect each other when they're next to each other. So you need to think about that when you're uh, designing as well. Uh, example of a spacing error here, the A and the V are way too far apart. I hope most of us would agree. Again, it's the I that tells you that it's right or wrong, so you may think that's fine. But uh, this is a case where those two lines are at the same angle, so if you just measured from the rightmost point of the A and the leftmost point of the V, you would have extra space in between them. You know, the font should be able to tell the computer okay, these are going to look funny, so when these characters are next to each other, scoot them together. And that's, that's what kerning is. Um, there are other spacing things, um, which we would call metrics, I guess. Horizontal bearings are just how much space is before a character and how much space is after it. And any screenshot we see of FontForge, you see those, those two lines here and here. Those are just the bearings. It's, it's, in, it's in the glyph saying, here's the generic amount of space you want on either side of this. And um, you can fix that if it's broken in a font just by opening up in the glyph editor and scooting those lines back and forth. They're like guides. They just move. The uh, vertical metrics are sort of defined for the entire font, which is weird. But it's like the lowest descender on the G or the P, whatever, that has some negative value and the highest capital character that has some value too. And those are defined for the font as a whole. So if you've got a font that has things sticking down below the line where they should be and intersecting the next line of text, you would, you would be able to fix that in the font information dialog box in FontForge. And that's what I'm showing here. Um, this is under the, I think it's the font menu. But on the left-hand side there, that's a whole bunch of sort of tabs. It's sort of poorly implemented. They don't look like tabs. But you just click through those, and it's a whole bunch of settings. The ones that matter are the ascent and descent things here. And you, uh, you can have font forms sort of guess at these for you when you start a new font. But if you can see that it's clearly wrong, you can just sort of start tweaking those. Um, you'd probably want to read the font forge site's documentation to get the real story on why there's more than one setting for those. And the reason there is is because a lot of different companies have tried to define font formats over the years. And they don't agree. You know, Microsoft and Apple don't agree on a lot, and they don't agree on whether and how ascent and descent work. But uh, if that's the problem with your font, it is easy to fix it in, in FontForge. Uh, oh, I actually didn't need to back up all that way. So there you go. Uh, the other thing that you can you can do is pull up a line of text in its own window in FontForge, and this allows you to see how your uh, your bearings are actually working in, in a word which is really what matters, right? It doesn't do a lot of good to look at that uh, character by itself and decide that's perfect. You have to bring them in other words. And you can see here, uh, the T and the O, for example, that's been scooted a lot because normally the T would have its bearing line way out where the actual T ends. So there's a big adjustment there. There's some smaller ones in other places. And where you see that in this window is this bottom line here. So the lines above it, they show each character and then what the, uh, the bearings are on the left and right. But sort of scooted in between those lines is how much the adjustment, the kerning adjustment is. 
And so if you find a font, in this case, average, the AV right here is a negative 57. So the V has been scooted in by 57 points there. But if the font was, uh, had no kerning at all, you'd just see a zero there, and you could sort of tweak that number and get it right, and then you'd be done. Uh, on the other hand, that is just you know, two words, and that's kind of all that FontForge offers in this regard. When you're designing fonts, you really want to look at like larger blocks of text, and that's something that FontForge doesn't do very well, but Font Matrix can help out. So this is a screenshot from Font Matrix where you've it's generated some lorem ipsum dummy text in the selected font over there. And you can look at the line spacing, and you can look at a lot more, and you'll fit onto the page uh, just by using one window with a couple of words. Um, so that's something that would be nice if, if FontForge fixed in the future, but um, yeah, there are other tools now. Another one, this is a, a web tool that basically does the same thing. You can drag and drop a font file onto it, and it will load it and show you example text. Sentences, a bunch of different sizes, paragraphs, different sizes. You can even change the color of it because sometimes you don't want everything to be black and white. Um, so that's, that's web-based. It's also, it is also free software, though. Um, I, I learned from the more experienced designers that you just never stop testing. You test when you've done two characters, and you test when you've done four and five and all the way up to several thousand. Um, I do want to mention some other web-based tools that sort of exist but aren't easy to take advantage of. There are some really cool JavaScript libraries out there for adjusting kerning and line spacing. And these are just three that, that I've named. There are more that do even crazier things than this. The thing is, uh, right now, they're all focused on displaying. So this is, if you want to have a really graphic designer looking website, you'll want to tweak things and add ligatures and so on. And they don't really, they're not really helped helpful when you're designing a font or when you're fixing one. But I think there's something worth watching because it's probably only a matter of time before some enterprising web developer decides, you know, I don't need to just kern things on my website. I could write a kerning tool using kerning.js. So we may see that. Um, we may not. I'd like to see that. Uh, the next big category is technical errors. and. That's an enormous category, because as I mentioned, there's all kinds of rules between these different font formats that disagree on things like uh, how wide should that grid be. You know, PostScript likes a 1,000 pixel grid, and TrueType likes powers of two, so it wants 1,024. And you can't have uh, a glyph where the outline crosses over itself. That's technically an error. It doesn't really look like it's causing an error here, because you can only sort of see um, you know, through the naked eye that, that there, those lines are crossing. If I had zoomed out on that, you might not be able to tell at all. And occasionally, if you're cutting things and rearranging parts, you can have a place where something was cut and twisted and you didn't see it, and it causes a little loop, and the font won't build or validate because of that. Um, another example, this is easier to tell because these are two separate contours that are sort of stuck together. And for whatever reason, FontForge in this situation shows you the area where they overlap as um, unfilled. And you know you can't, that's not correct. You need to sort of uh, union those in vector editing terms. But that is something that you would probably find in a font someone was working on, because the letter M, it really is the letter N with sort of an extra curve on the side of it. So most people, when they design it, they'll make the N and then just copy that right-hand part and paste it on there. And if you're not sure, if you need to squeeze it together a little bit, you want them to be separate until the last possible moment, and then do that union, and then not put the font. But um, you know that is solely a technical error. It's not going to look different to a person reading a line of text. Uh, there's also hinting and grid fitting, which I sort of don't want to get into because it's really terrible. And uh, FontForge has some tools for doing this kind of thing. Hinting and grid fitting is the process of taking those outlines and converting them into the actual pixel blocks on whatever the display device is. And a lot of energy has been spent over the years by professional people writing their own hinting algorithms that work differently, different sizes, so that it knows to make sure that you scoot these things apart when you're aligning it to the grid so there's a little space there so that the top of the, the circle of the eye doesn't get squished down onto the, anyway. Um, it's really not easy to do that stuff 
in FontForge, and it's basically sort of a general purpose programming problem. Um, there's a stack-based language for doing that, and you would have to learn it. But the good news is you don't really have to, because uh, modern operating systems can sort of automatically hint things when they're rendered. And by modern operating systems, I mean Linux and Mac OS X. Uh, it, that list does not include Windows, though. And Windows, poor Windows users, as a result, they need something like TTF auto hints. This is a tool written by uh, Werner Lindberg, who's one of the free type developers. And what it does is runs the free type auto hinter like it normally would if it was displaying a font, but it saves the hints and embeds them into the font file. So it's a command line thing. You just say TTF auto hints, the name of this font, TTF, and it fixes it, essentially. And it fixes it in a way that only Windows users will benefit from, but then again, the Linux and Mac users don't need it to be fixed. So it's, it's helpful. It's pretty simple. I can show you an example here. I think I accidentally switched the before and after shots there, but um, that's pretty small. Um, you'd want to zoom in to see the difference. And you can see the, the plus and minus character there. The one on the left has been TTF auto hinted, and it's not blurry. Um, the one on the right is blurry. Except you will notice that it's only the vertical dimension that got unblurrified. And the reason that TTF auto hint doesn't try to do the horizontal is that when you start messing with the horizontal widths of things, then that can affect over the course of 60 characters how much fits on a line. And they just didn't want to mess with that. So it's going to look sharper by doing the vertical alone, but doing the horizontal too would maybe cause some errors that would be really hard to fix. Um, for all the other technical things, there are validation tools in FontForge. There, it's called uh, Find Problems, which is pretty helpful. And again, I think you would really want to read the documentation on, on that on the FontForge website or in the uh, FontForge book that I mentioned earlier because some of those things are not applicable to every font, and some of them are a waste of time. But um, if you find a font with technical errors, you can, you can fix it in FontForge. Uh, now onto the dark matter, um, which is probably what I think most people find more interesting about font design is not fixing something that's wrong, but adding something that's missing. Um, that's because, as someone who knows German will tell you, um, there's this weird double S character um, yes. Yeah, yeah, I was, yeah. Um, anyway, you don't necessarily get that with, with the font that you find on 1001freefonts.org. Um, but the thing you, you should realize is that uh, adding that character yourself, if you know what it looks like, is not any harder than firing up FontForge and fixing a broken looking glyph from elsewhere in the font. Um, and if you think that only, only Germans have this opportunity in front of them, um, there are a lot of languages that have one or two special characters that are likely to get overlooked by somebody who's just doing a font on their own without a lot of experience, so extra characters that are missing. Another really big one is uh, currency signs, because they're outside of Europe, which has one currency sign. There are a lot of them all over the world, and they're usually not complicated. I mean, this is the Ukrainian hryvnia sign, and it's you know sort of an S, but it has the equal sign on it. A lot of um, currency signs are things that you could, you could make in FontForge. If you want to do a service to somebody that you know, um, you can make a uh, currency sign for them. Mathematical symbols are pretty important as well. Um, a lot of fonts will go as far as plus and minus, and maybe they'll have divide, and maybe not. But uh, um, there's always more math to be done out there. Uh, punctuation is another one. You, your older fonts, like back in the metal type era, you probably got exclamation and question and parentheses and some things like that. But if you want to add the upside down exclamation point that would be used in Spanish, you can do that. And in fact, that would be really simple because you would just copy the regular exclamation point and rotate it. Um, another one would be ligatures. Ligatures are things that uh, combine several characters that are in danger of sort of stepping on each other's toes because they get so close. And there's sort of a set of basic Latin ligatures, F, 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 I, F, L, F, F, L. And uh, a lot of sort of generic font projects are going to skip over those. And um, that's something that anybody can add if they want to fire up the editor, find the F and L character in this case, 
skewed them together until they match and you know, um, make their own ligature. Uh, going further than that though, a, a really big uh, service that, that people can do is extending fonts into uh, languages that aren't, or that are underserved. Uh, this is Greek. It's the Greek Unicode block. And the font that I, uh, this is from a font called News Cycle that I made. And the original News Cycle is a, is a revival of a 1908 font called News Gothic. And that was created in the English speaking world and just had basic Latin characters. So it, it was, my, the task here was to sort of take the design cues and make Greek letters that seem to match them. Um, same with Cyrillic. Cyrillic is uh, actually a much bigger alphabet than Greek because there's a lot more languages. There's two languages that use the Greek alphabet and there's 20 something or 30 in Cyrillic. But another one that uh, doesn't get a lot of airplay is sort of the Latin extended. Uh, this is Latin extended B, which covers a lot of African languages. And a lot of African languages use essentially the Latin alphabet plus two or three extra characters to represent vowel sounds or, um, or consonant sounds that just aren't supported in uh, normal Latin, Latin alphabet. So it looks like a lot and it's a pretty big block of Unicode, but each individual language only has a few. And the, the nice thing is that uh, it's, it's only a couple of characters and they're by and large based on the characters you're familiar with. So when I stumbled into the problem with the, the Cyrillic long I, I didn't really have experience with that character, but I, I do understand what an O with a hook on it is like. Um, you, you still, that's no excuse for not having people who read the language test it and say, no, that's, that's too big, that's too small. But um, it is something that I think a lot of people could, uh, could help to make a contribution with. The other thing probably worth discussing is what to do when you do fix somebody else's font. Um, by and large, I think people who work on open fonts, which are the ones that you're allowed to share those changes uh, with, they are thrilled to have feedback because as with any open source project, they don't get a lot. I don't get a lot. I've gotten maybe like five or six bug reports total in uh, three years. Um, the thing is, if you know, for example, that the Cyrillic long I is wrong and you fix it, uh, you can't really make a patch and send that in because font files can have things in different orders depending on the encoding and that would get really messy. So probably what I would recommend is just make a version of the font that has that fix in it and share that with the person who's the original designer. And if you can't do it or if you just can't figure out how to make it look right, at least file a bug report. Um, the, the trick there is that whether or not there's a real bug tracker available is uh, going to vary a lot by the project. There are some really big projects, big pro font projects we've all heard of, like Deja Vu and Ubuntu, and SIL, which is a linguistics organization that makes a lot of fonts that make Gentium, which is the one that I've used in the presentation here. Uh, they all have their own way of storing issue trackers and where the source is held, if it's held anywhere at all. SIL, for instance, uh, it uses closed source tools because they care about releasing the font under free license, but they're not a free software organization. So they, they use what their designers want. Uh, it's, um, you know, it's their choice. On the other hand, there are issues like uh, Ubuntu, the Ubuntu font. Canonical has a contract with the Foundry, Dalton Mag, to, to fix that. I, I'm not privy to the internals of that contract, but I know that you can tell them you want something fixed and someone from Dalton Mag will look at it, hopefully, make the fix or not. Um, but then again, the sources are in Launchpad, so you can go look at it and just add it as an issue yourself, um, as opposed to Libertine, which has a really formal process for, for making changes, or Deja Vu, which is so large that it's complicated to get things done sometimes, because it's a huge project with a lot of contributors. Um, but the bottom line is that you should just go do it. Um, it may seem weird and intimidating to open a font and twist the letters around, but it'll only be weird and intimidating, hopefully, the first time. Um, and the other great thing about fonts is that with open fonts, you can do whatever you want. Like, uh, I've chosen some old fonts that I want to make digital versions of that are free, and it's just because I want to work on those. I have a couple of them Google has been interested in picking up, but uh, 
I just, it's like any other open source project. I like doing it because I like doing it. it uh, I think it offers some unusual opportunities in the sense that you have to work on left brain problems and right brain problems at the same time. You know, it has to look good, but it also has to actually be correct. And, um, you know, fonts are one of the few areas that uh, allow you to do that. I think that's my last slide. Yeah. So this, this is contact information for me if you want. Um, I am a reporter and editor, so the top address there. Um, feel free to send me an email if you have news of some kind that you think really needs to get out there. I can't actually decide. I'm not the final say on anything, but um, yeah, let me know. On the other hand, if you just want to talk about the font stuff, the second address is probably better there. Uh, then again, Twitter, Twitter does not allow two-character usernames, so uh, I have to get wordy on that one. Um, and then the last, the last few links there, Google Web Fonts is a big collection of open source fonts. They have uh, paid designers, they have found people who already had fonts and had their own weird custom license and said, if you, would you be willing to put it under a more convenient license? And the last one there is Open Font Library. It's uh, a little misspelled, but um, use your imagination. Um, Open Font Library, the, the project has been in some flux lately. Um, but the goal is to have a place where people can go and find at least an, an index to all the open fonts that are out there because Google is only one source of those and there are a lot of people who do their own and who don't want to run a font service themselves. Um, so yeah, that's about it for me. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I know that I covered a lot of unrelated little topics there. Um, and there are certainly more things that we could talk about as far as what makes a font wrong and how do you know when it's right. So any questions on that, just fire away right now or come see me later. Um, yes? I think you're first. Thanks. Um, I just have a quick question, um, mainly about when fonts get reduced to smaller sizes, mm -hmm. what's, what, um, I don't know, what ways are there to improve the quality of the font as it reduces in size? Because I'm seeing a great quality degradation as the size gets smaller. Yeah. Um, the, the tricky, I think what's tricky about that is that there are a lot of places in the chain from the font file to what actually gets displayed. And it, it's going to be real situationally dependent where you need to make the fix. Um, so. If it's in Firefox, for instance, Firefox is, is doing some work on spacing and rendering, and it's also choosing uh, substitutions for fonts if the font is requested is not there, whereas if it's, and then below that, the OS layer does some of that too. Uh, ultimately, though, the ultimate correct answer in theory is that's what hinting and grid fitting is for. Um, and like I said, it's, it's pretty complicated to do right. Uh, I can back up and show you, I don't know if anybody noticed some of the pictures that I was showing had these sort of colorful rectangles. Yeah, you can see the blue, green, and red there. FontForge has an auto hint command that you can issue and you can select a bunch of characters and it will try and find what it thinks are components that need to be kept together. So it's decided that the left and right hand side of the O slash, those should probably be vertical. So it's put a blue which in this, on porch theme means vertical blue hint on those. And you can see the full extent of it there. Um, that leaves a lot out that could still look rather squished when it gets down to a really small point size. Um, but I, you know, it's a start. I don't think that this is one of those things because the ultimate answer is the eyes, what tells you you're right, it's probably not possible to automatically do hinting and have it be perfect. Um, yeah, so I'm sorry, that, that's not very satisfactory, I guess, but um, yeah. Did that, did that answer the question? I'm sorry. Uh, partly. 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 I was also interested in the process of the steps that you go through. Right. Um, to be honest, uh, I, haven't done, I haven't done manual hinting in the fonts that I've done just because the process is so arcane. Um, I don't know if I mentioned, it, it has a little, it's a little virtual machine, the, the hinter is, the hinting engine, and there are just opcodes that you push onto the stack 
for each glyph, each glyph. Well, under the hood, a, a font is really a table full of tables. So there's the table that has all the glyphs in it, and then there's the table that has, okay, these need to be kern in this way, and these need to be combined with accent marks and things. And the the hints are, are in a table, and um, yeah, it's just it's sort of any way you can think of that might be the right algorithm for determining. Um, here's how to adjust these lines so that they always line up to pixel grid at this size and at this size. Someone's done it, and it's sort of so open that I don't have good advice. I think a lot of people don't care anymore because screen resolutions are getting better, <laughs> which is cheap and sort of cheating, but um, yeah, that's, that's life, I guess. Sorry. Yeah, Nathan, that was just going to be my question, is that, you know, is that becoming less important as people are assuming that the resolution is going to be sufficient that hinting on the really small stuff just they don't bother anymore? Are we close? Uh, well, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a continuum, right? I mean, there's some people are always going to care more than others. And it's, I don't think you're ever going to be at the point where all screens are so high resolution e ink that no one thinks about it anymore. If for no other reason, then we all have phones now. And your phones are doing the same font rendering. Well, not the same, but they're doing font rendering too. And um, yeah, you, you either have to have smaller text so you can fit a page worth onto that screen, or um, you have to scroll a lot, so people are going to shrink the fonts to fits. And um, I don't know, there's, there's so many variables there in terms of is there hinting of the font, and then how is it rendered, and then what's the display resolution, and then the user ultimately decides, I want to shrink it even further. And um, since you can't ultimately control the user's choice there, it's probably always going to be a problem in some situations. Um, on, on the other hand, sort of the, I think one of the font designer answers is you don't really have to do all that work for most fonts because most of the fonts people use where they want something stylistically cool looking like the NPR logo or if you've got a big banner for your company, um, that's going to be at a big resolution because it's for that purpose. If you were making a font designed to be used in books and to be used for a large blocks of text that would be worth going to all that trouble in. And um, that's why some really high quality fonts like Gentium, they went through that process because they want Gentium to be useful in, in prints and under extreme circumstances of large blocks. Um, but then again, how many, how many book fonts do you personally need? I suppose that's the question. I don't, I don't want to spend the amount of time that it, it takes to do Gentium again because what I find is that I'm not going to displace it. Um, yeah. That may be an unsatisfactory answer, too. I don't know. No, that's good. Um, just on the licensing sort of thing, if you've got a non-freely licensed font um, and there's a glyph missing that you want to add in, obviously you can't redistribute the changes you've made, but are there any legal issues around that sort of thing? Well, uh, if you have a non-free a non -free font, and there's only a few licenses that people really use for open fonts. Um, if you purchase a font from like Adobe or, or from Monotype or something like that, you have some sort of contract with them that's going to tell you what you can and can't do. And um, I know that what I hear a lot of times from people who are actual typesetters and making books and things is that they generally have the freedom to make those adjustments when they're printing something. What gets trickier is, can they make adjustments if they're then distributing that electronically? And that's why there is an open font license. The OFL was created because once people started embedding fonts in PDFs, the traditional type foundries that had never had their fonts distributed electronically got upset and wanted to start closing things down and, and lock them down. So um, it seems like you generally have the right to, to fix it if you're going to print it, whether you have the right to fix it if you're electronically using it as another story. Um, but yeah, that's, that's why they work on the open font license. Hey, do we have a final question? Because we're almost out of time. No? OK. Well, I'm sure you'll all agree that this was a great talk. Thank you very much, Nathan. It was lovely having you. Oh, thanks. <laughs>